There are varying perspectives on the question of whether Zimbabwe has done its absolute best to do two things. Firstly, to align its laws to this fairly new constitution, and secondly, inculcate a spirit of constitutionalism in its policy and practices. These are crit critical conversations we need to embrace for our own good as a nation. But this can only happen through constructive, honest dialogue. Indeed, democracy begins in conversations despite our differences. This meeting marks the beginning of a year-long series of activities across the nation as we celebrate Zimbabwe's 10-year-old constitution. This is our small contribution as crisis in Zimbabwe coalition to the betterment of our country. It reaffirms our belief in constitutionalism as a key tenant of national prosperity and development. It is our collective duty as citizens and duty bearers to respect, promote, and defend the, this constitution. To begin these conversations, we have brought together some of the key actors behind the constitution-making process that produced the 2013 constitution, and these include co-chairpersons and spokespersons of the constitution, parliamentary, Comit COPAC, the National Constitutional Assembly, NCA, who campaigned against the COPAC draft, COPAC draft, the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, the Law Society of Zimbabwe, and the Legal Resources Foundation. This process does not seek to pay a particular line, but brings the Constitution back to the fore in terms of its centrality in consolidating the premise of constitution, <coughs> attendant institutions, and processes that can support a culture of constitutionalism and help Zimbabwe's quest for inclusive development for all. Let me therefore take this opportunity to wish you all a robust discussion in this quest to entrench constitution constitutionalism in our motherland. Thank you, comrades, for coming and welcome, and hope all of us are going to enjoy this discussion. The idea of Zimbabwe writing a constitution. What would we say, if you could go back memory lane, what were some of the key aspirations around this document? Why does it matter so much? The struggle for a just constitution, it is the document which governs the people. It is the document which provides rights for those who govern, it drives their power. So when people went to war, they were being ruled through a constitution which had been imposed upon them by the colonialists. And it gave the colonialists a lot of power, excluding the indigenous Zimbabweans from governors of the country. And people went to go to war. Many people died for this constitution. And for the war to stop, the colonialists then called the nationalists to Lancaster House, where a constitution was given to them as a ceasefire document. And we, Zimbabwe was aware that the document which was ruling them from 1980 was a ceasefire document. And being a ceasefire document, the people were not consulted. So they were being governed by a document which was literally imposed upon them to stop the war. The thinking then was, well, let's accept this constitution if it is going to usher in majority rule, if we are going to have our country into our own hands. But there was no sufficient consultation. It did not come from the people. So even after we had obtained independence, there was this quest for saying, why can we not have a constitution generated by the people of Zimbabwe themselves under no pressure? So I think my colleagues uh, informed you of the various attempts which were made at having a constitution generated by Zimbabweans and for Zimbabweans. And that's how, after, I will cut short the whole story, but that's when there was a government of national unity in place, one of the key aspects which, we, which was agreed upon 
by the parties was to say, in order for Zimbabwe to be a democratic nation, let us have a constitution which comes from the people. And I want to make a distinction between people and citizens. Uh, my view is that, uh, you might not like me for this, but this is my view. I don't think that we have citizens in Zimbabwe. I think we have the people of Zimbabwe, uh, generally. Yes, we are people of Zimbabwe, but in terms of citizens, yeah, personally, I have difficulty, I have difficulty identifying citizens acting as citizens. So, um, I, in, att in an attempt to answer your question, the reason why in 2013 there was a constitution, yet we got independent in, uh, in 1980, was because uh, the status quo, the powers that be, um, as, 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 uh, as Honorable Mangwana said here, yeah, they received uh, like a ceasefire document from Lancaster House, but they were, as history will show, they were content with governing with it, with a few, you know, with here and there, um, cuts and um, excisions and patches and so on. It served them pretty well, but the, the sentiment among a lot of the public was that we needed a whole new constitution, so there was a well, there was a groundswell of uh, popular, how can I call it, uh, demand for a constitution that came from civil society organizations that conglomerated around the banner of the National Constitutional Assembly that was formed in order to, to, to um, broaden, interesting, the, the human rights, the, bill, uh, the Declaration of Rights, get a new constitution and then have it done. It was civil society that climbed for that. And my controversial view is that I think they actually succeeded I talked about the failed process of 2000. In the 2000, uh, I called it failed, but I really don't, my, I don't see it as such. In my own view, uh, civil society, through the National Constitutional Assembly at Ambedrela, pushed and pushed and pushed until the government in power acceded. They pushed it to a corner until the former president, Robert Mugabe, said, hey, 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 all right, all right, let's have a constitution. But unfortunately, this is my view, civil society didn't see it, they won, they actually succeeded in compelling um, the government to accede to the need for a new constitution, but they didn't see it, they didn't see that they'd won, instead they decided to boycott the process, and because they thought it would fail, and ultimately it failed. So, I think the scoreline for the 2000 process was, I think Honorable Mangwana's parties and UPF won, I think they won, they, they scored one, and the NCA scored one also because they succeeded in a no vote. But the citizens, I think, got zero. So it's one, one, zero. Don't ask me what game, but that's the <laughs> scoreline. <laughs> but so the role of the citizens, ultimately, because we didn't get a constitution in 2000 because of the no vote, the need was still there. So they continued to be this need. And ultimately, because of the political struggle and the political history and the tussle between the major protagonists, the NDC and ZANU PF, and also civil society, there was need. The global political agreement, it's a long, I, sorry, Jennifer, the global political agreement that was agreed to in September 20, 20, 20, 2008, uh, accepted that need that there was still clamor in Zimbabwe from the populace and also the country just really, it was clear the writing was on the wall that we need a new, uh, we need a birth certificate, a, a form of one as a country. Yeah. Would you agree that this has become part, although citizens were clearly part of this demand for wanting a birth certificate, did we get the birth certificate we want? What happened? Thank you. So, I want to compare the constitution that we are talking about today to the 1980 constitution. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, from the process and uh, the way that it was drafted, uh, we got uh, a better document, more particularly in terms of uh, the Bill of Rights provisions, we did get uh, a better document. And then we also got uh, better provisions, though not 100% perfect, got better provisions uh, that created a foundation uh, for possibly developing and sustaining uh, democratic institutions when we had the constitution in 2013. It was not perfect, but it was a much better document. 
And why I say that, if I'm looking at the Bill of Rights, for instance, we now have a constitution, we now have a constitution that is an expansive Bill of Rights. We have social and economic rights, we have environmental rights, we protect the value of the marginalized. So in terms of uh, having a better document, or not perfect, it was a better document. But of course, when you do an analysis of the document, you can actually see when the negotiations were taking place during the process uh, from the principals who were participating in the process. So I would say eventually for the citizens, um, as a starting point from where we were, uh, it was a better vision of the constitution, not perfect, but also guided by the trends uh, from the region, South Africa, Kenya. You can actually see where we drew from those and were inspired. I want to, if I, if I may, just uh, jump in, Ms. Bro. Can I jump to uh, Honorable Monzoa? Uh, because you were also there at, 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 at that drafting stage of looking for our foundational documents. If you look at the birth certificate that we, we've got, uh, you know, we've got this framework. Would you say that the culture, that clamoring that was there at the beginning, is, are we still clamoring around the Constitution? Is there still noise around the Constitution? I don't think the noise around the constitution is that much. Uh, the noise that we hear is for the constitution to be followed. Um, you see, the constitution is the most, the second most important book in any country after the Bible or the Quran. It represents the social contract between the, the governed and the governors. And there is one principle of constitutional law uh, that I think the citizens of Zimbabwe must understand. In this social contract called the Constitution, the rulers must only do that which the Constitution allows them. And the ruled can do anything else unless that which is prohibited uh, in the Constitution. So it represents a balance of power in favor of the citizens. They have more power. They may not know it. They may have more power than the rule. And, and let me just say, um, a lot of things went into uh, the writing of this constitution, which I, if, if, if you don't mind, I want to share. There was a lot of rebellion on the part of the COPAC, on the part of the leadership of the COPAC against the government. Uh, for example, we were only allowed to travel if we had um, a cabinet authority, you couldn't travel if you were an MP uh, without a cabinet authority. But Honorable Mangwana and myself, we decided to go to South Africa to see Cyril Ramaphosa and Ralph Mayer without the cabinet authority. And uh, uh, as time went on, there was, um, uh, uh, I was arrested and so on. And uh, the other members of COPA, refused to, to, to do work until I was liberated. So there was a lot of rebellion against the state. Another um, instance that, that I remember, uh, the late Chief Justice Shijawsi called us um, uh, to a meeting with all the judges of the Supreme Court and they did not want the Constitutional Court. And they said you should never legislate for a Constitutional Court in this country. Um, after having their lunch, after eating their lunch, uh, and when we were giving the vote of thanks, I simply said to them, thank you for the lunch, but Zimbabwe is going to have a constitutional court. And uh, when the parties failed to agree in a fundamental way, it was left to Honorable Mangwana and myself to rebel against the uh, management committee. And we said we are going to solve this thing the way we, we deem fit. And we then dealt with those, I think, six issues. So it, it took a lot of courage to come up with this document. There were a lot of dangers. There were assassination attempts. Um, some of us were imprisoned. I was imprisoned for 27 days um, uh, for having insisted on one fundamental issue. And today we want to confess Honorable Mangwana and myself. In, I know some of you have seen The Democrats, which is that film that deals about the Constitution. And by the way, it has been banned in Zimbabwe. The documentary on the Constitution is actually banned in Zimbabwe. 
it has won in, uh, 19 international awards. But in that documentary, you will see a, 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 a section where we are debating about whether Mugabe is disqualified or not. The truth is we drafted that thing. And the truth is we wanted to disqualify him. And I just want you to just... <laughs> I just, I just want you to uh, look um, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the situation of the time and I want you to appreciate the unfathomable courage that the men and women in the COPAC had to have uh, disqualifying Robert Mugabe. We drafted it in a, in a clever, clever, a subtle manner, but uh, they picked it up. And uh, let me just end by telling you where we started drafting. We did not want CIO to know where we were drafting it from. And we chose a place where we thought nobody would expect us to be drafting from. And we were drafting from First Street. Um, because we knew no one would ever expect us to do that. And for, I think for two or three months nobody knew. Until I think somebody became careless and we were discovered. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for, for that opportunity. I know I digressed a little bit, but I thought the young people I'm seeing have to know a bit of the history of how their constitution came about. Thank you. Clearly our opposition to it was based on what uh, we considered and still consider to have been wrong which is the domination of a constitution-making process by the dominant political parties of the day. Uh, that is the basis upon which uh, I think that uh, we were proceeding as a group that was opposed to it. I think there will be differences as to what is meant by people do. And uh, I know that those who were in the process were able to say that I am sure Honorable Mangwana and Senator Monsoraye would have explained the basis upon which they were satisfied that it was people driven. We took a totally different view. And up to now, I disagree with that approach. May I pray, I think that's the word I want to use, pray that um, these differences be known, that uh, people belong to the different processes, and then we keep exchanging views on that. And I belong to the group that says that the constitution making process must never be dominated by the politicians of the day, no matter how popular they are, whatever methods they use. But there are others who say that there is no other practical way of doing it. You, you just have to do it that way. Those are respectable views. It is not belong that people must appreciate that. So when I then you question and say, so why did you um, oppose the amendment to this constitution? What would be wrong is to say that in opposing the amendment, I was defending the constitution. I think that is the equivalent of Joe Energy. I was defending the notion that uh, those who are in power at any one point who are dominant must never tip around, even if the constitution was, wrong. in our view, not properly people driven. But it's now in place. When we now want to change it, change that which was not, according to us, democratically put in place. We must have a democratic way of doing it, uh, of trying to change it. And we, I was in the same position I was in when we were with Dagi and others uh, in the NCA. Lancaster House was not our product. We knew that Lancaster House came from uh, London, that it was a few people uh, who were very important then in the liberation struggle who came about with the process, never British. But so when we say today people driven process, we were not saying we are defending Lancaster. We were still finding the notion here those who are dominant would do so. So even as we speak now, I think that uh, those in Zanope, I'm not sure, and then I see that uh, Fortune is now a big person there who Zanope, I think who who lived outside. He's the one who's in charge there. Uh, I know that the value philosophy, that philosophy hasn't gone. If it is, don't say it. The belief you if I am in power, she said to report, and in fact, the most important thing is to change the constitution. And so as I see it, and I will get, give another prayer, is there's another prayer philosophy. Power is not enjoyable unless I 
deal with the constitution. The witch is out there. That is If you don't do that, you are not deserving. No mentality there. Tap in, tap in, tap in. Tap in, tap in, tap in. Okay, do you think about this? I look at that and so. Akuna is a leader who would want to go away without changing the constitution. But it's okay, it's our own road. That's second. But the first one is that. Then when Copac came, Copac was genuinely thinking that they would be different. And that's why I know the colleagues there. They genuinely thought that they would be different. <laughs> then we dagger my 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 that now Kodaru Chairman provision. Yeah, limitation. And obviously everyone says I think could have been done differently. They came up with the with the very important thing of the independent commission. So they got a chairperson who was not going to listen to anyone, she's not listening to anyone. She disagreed with her own commission, threw them out of the commission, disagreed with the parliament, disagreed with the president. Whatever she did. Now as we sit, and this is what I was saying, but, uh, she produced a disastrous delimitation report. Totally nonsensical. But uh, you see that uh, people say, well, because of the constitution, Tony, when a constitution fails to rescue society in such a situation, there's something wrong with it. I'm a winner in the future. Thank you very much for that. Uh, oh, is, it, is it putting us in the position of the history and the current affairs at the same time? Uh, the talk about the constitution, which brings us to this issue around the constitution. I want to start with a small one. You know, uh, in 1980, I obviously wasn't, uh, you know, a full adult in 1980, but I don't recall, you know, hearing about a constitutional alignment process. You know, I, even though it was a negotiated uh, Lancaster House constitution, it was written off continent. Uh, we were not that many. Chakatoyanima briefcase, Chakatoyanima briefcase, international, Chakatoyanima it was law. My question is, why did we have to have a process that said we must now align, you know, our laws to the constitution? When in 1980, we essentially got a new constitution, we were a new country, and I don't recall a historical alignment of the Constitution. I'm going to start there and I'm going to start with uh, uh, Honorable Chasi. And I'm going to ask the Ministry to talk to us a little bit about processes around Constitution making. Yes, to start from the recognition that uh, um, it was basically a wartime or peacetime document. And I think the narrations by Senator Manzora, uh, which I suspect are shared by Komri uh, Mangwana uh, and uh, Professor Maduku, clearly demonstrate that. Um, but I think the biggest achievement for us as a country was that we were galvanized together. We came together. And the two gentlemen came from different sides of the political divide. But I'm sure you have heard the highly treasonous things that they did to come up, to contribute to the Constitution. And so, uh, for me, that is the biggest uh, takeaway from that process. There is no doubt that uh, um, it has never been um, a perfect Constitution. Neither was the Constitution-making process itself perfect. We all know that, uh, I remember at the time I was with the RBZ, there were provisions there dealing with uh, um, such matters as uh, the independence of the central bank, which purportedly were discussed by Anna Mboyaku and I too, Tito. And so that just goes to show you that these two people would go and tell their people. Yeah. 
So each political party would feed its own people with incomprehensible <coughs> concepts and ideas, which were beyond uh, the people that we were speaking to. So, to some degree, I agree with Professor Mandu that uh, because of the dominance of our political parties, uh, it translated into really provisions, maybe that were attributable to the elites within the political parties, because uh, there is no way. Um, we are on the title of the church. We'll be able to enunciate the idea behind separate independence and mental policy and that type of thing. So it's quite clear. But at some point, the decisions had to be made. And so with the coming in of this constitution, we have a building block for taking our country forward. I'm a firm believer that the uh, constitution should not be. Uh, amended willy nilly. But I also think that in the nascent stages of our constitution, it's inevitable in some respects. Uh, there is a concept in constitutional law where we refer to the constitution as the grand norm, which is basically the grand norm, like the pith of society. So that central part of it should not be amendable. But uh, when I made the decision that I was going to get into active politics, uh, I was a bit, um, um, I found myself in a difficult situation because there were clearly provisions which were not working. And uh, being in the Ministry of Justice meant that we had to initiate some amendments but we were also aware of the fact that the general view that was held by uh, uh, academics, like Professor Baduku and uh, lawyers and other professions, was that we should not temper the Constitution. And yet, it probably, uh, uh, at that time, it was very, very difficult to propose any amendment because of precisely the problem of perception that we were desirous of, you know, just amending the constitution uh, to, 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 to our needs. And so, but we came up with a template. Uh, I was responsible for this. We went through the constitution and came up with uh, amendments that we felt were supposed to be done in order to ensure that the various pieces of legislation that are run by uh, the different ministries were amended in order to ensure that we are in line with the constitution. <coughs> we had an interministerial committee uh, which we tried to run from the ministry. But uh, ministries also in their positions vis-a-vis -vis the various uh, um, um, pieces of legislation that they run and, uh, for example, I'll give you a, a provision in the Constitution that was very close to me, uh, because now I could not get it. Uh, I'll be saying that. <laughs> the issue pertaining to housing, the issue pertaining to housing, the fact that it's a right within our Constitution, and and yet we see day in, day out, people have built their little mansions being demolished. There is no better way to assault a person's dignity than to make them homeless. Sure. Uh, I'm also MP in an area where you have uh, what we commonly call the complex, <coughs> the forgotten people, where housing issues are not even an issue. And yet people live in uh, conditions that are extremely primitive. No water, no power, and so forth. And so, one would think that, uh, as the Constitution contemplates, by now we will have a law which clearly spells out the rights to housing. It's not enough to say that everyone is a right to housing. Which is why you find that uh, most of those people who are affected are illiterate or at least legally illiterate. So they will be served with the summons, they can't afford a lawyer, they can't defend themselves, and they get evicted. 
and it is the evictor, simply says, we are we have an eviction order. And so, in my contemplation, some of the key amendments would have been to make sure that there are no mass evictions in situations where there is no assurance that people have actually been, been given alternative accommodation, which means that the Minister of Land must be party to the proceedings, the Minister of Housing must be party to the proceedings, and the Minister of Local Government, and the court must ensure that those defendants are legally represented. So there is still a kind of life of uh, things to be done. It's regrettable that uh, 10 years down the line, we have actually not finished this, uh, 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 you know, this alignment process. And I think we need to approach it much more enthusiastically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with the alignment process is ongoing. And um, as some may know and some may not know, it started in 2015. And that's when the interministerial um, committee was, was created, including the Ministry of Justice and several ministries as well, with directors that were involved. Um, where we are now, uh, at that point in 2015, 185, about 185 rules were identified that needed alignment. And then about 19 were recognized as laws that needed to be um, brought in uh, as new laws because there were gaps that were identified after the coming of the Constitution. And that would bring us to a total of about 204. And in that process, um, the Ministry, uh, together with uh, Parliament, has enacted a total of about 100 and no, about 189, leaving 22 statutes um, still to be uh, aligned to the Constitution. Um, I want to bring us back to the issue of housing that was mentioned by the Honourable. Um, alignment is a long process. It can be a long process. Um, at times, uh, the consultations take a while. At times, the ministries involved um, take a while as well. Uh, but then policies are brought in to try and cover for those gaps. And on the housing aspect to the right to property, I believe recently, um, as, as I'm aware, the, there was a launch of the National uh, Title Deeds um, in Epworth, and that is supposed to be going around in all um, areas around the country. Uh, to actually regularize the irregularized um, places. So it's, it's a process, obviously time, time consuming and it will take time, but it is a start to recognizing that there are issues, there are gaps, and again, housing is an issue and evictions should not happen the way um, they have been happening, which is why people have the right to property, have the right to land, and should be awarded their title deeds to avoid the issue of eviction when they are on their properties. Thank you very much. Um, um, I think uh, Rose Ambota uh, earlier on, there was a question around, do you think the constitution was made for the people? and um, my take is uh, for a constitution uh, put in the day one, there must be wide consultations. Uh, wide consultations in the sense that uh, our citizenry is um, composed of various groupings uh, with my interest in Asia and Asia. Uh, and for, for a constitution to address those uh, various interests, People should be widely consulted and they should effectively participate. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to answer that? If I can also just sure, uh, add yes. to what she has said. Yes. The ministry has a department called the Constitutional Parliamentary Affairs Department, which uh, before was 
ministry in itself before it became a department incorporated within the Ministry of Justice. And within that department, the ministry is mandated to promote public awareness of the Constitution, that the communities, individuals, the citizenry are aware of the Constitution and their rights and what the contents of the Constitution hold. Um, and that is the beginning of it becoming recognized as Constitution Yivani. Nukuti Constitution And to add, it has gone further with development partners to um, have it transcribed into Braille to accommodate persons with disabilities and also in sign language to accommodate those with um, hearing impairment as well. Uh, these are just some progressive steps to showing the people, to showing the people of Zimbabwe that constitutional is the greater, and we are supposed to know it. Thank you. Uh, the lawyers are doing the members of the law society on the ground. Uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of lawyers who are in civil society, particularly because uh, Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights uh, is a not for profit organization that is working uh, with other civil society organizations in the country to try and create awareness and increase the literacy on the provisions of the constitution. So, since 2013, Numerous uh, sessions have been conducted in the grassroots, uh, with grassroots based organizations in the communities uh, to create awareness trainings, uh, when lawyers uh, and other civil society organization members have gone out to the communities. Uh, they do trainings on the constitution, different uh, provisions of the constitution. And as you can see, uh, Veritas, one of the civil society organizations, has also produced uh, a simple document on what the Bill of Rights provisions are in the Constitution. And other than going out to the communities, radio programs have been conducted numerous. Um, we've also been embracing the use of social media platforms. And for us as lawyers uh, in the civil society, we believe that the Constitution is for the people of Zimbabwe. And if you read the preamble of the Constitution, it starts by saying, we the people of Zimbabwe. And it should be there to protect the rights of the people. So we have seen it as our duty, not just as lawyers, but also as citizens of this country to ensure that everyone is able to be protected by the supreme law, the highest law of the land. So those are some of the interventions that we've done. And as civil society members, as lawyers in civil society, we have always been available to offer the technical support to anyone who may need us to assist in interpreting and creating more awareness of the institution. Thank you. All right, um, <clears throat> just to add on also, um, I think uh, the Law Society of Zimbabwe was one of the first organizations which also conducted a constitutional audit. And uh, I don't know if Honorable Mangwana and Honorable Manzora uh, remember, but I was their assistant during that time. Um, we uh, took uh, down all the laws that required alignment during that time. And um, I think it is a document that, that uh, was then borrowed by other, other organizations, but it was a good starting point. Um, what lawyers are also do, what the law society is also doing to promote uh, constitutionalism and the rule of law, uh, apart from what uh, was already alluded to, um, lawyers are conducting um, constitutional awareness sessions as well in conjunction with the Ministry of Justice, constitutional literacy, there are uh, various trainings uh, that have been offered by the Law Society of Zimbabwe to um, government institutions, uh, particularly the Legal Aid Directorate, the National Prosecuting Authority, that is helping the law officers in those departments to break down the constitution for them to understand it when they interact, for example, with the public. This is uh, in line with promoting access to justice by the general citizenry. Um, we have also gone uh, on to train our lawyers. Um, as you might know, the constitution is composed of uh, various generations of rights. Uh, apart from the economic, social and cultural rights that have been, um, I think, spoken of, we also have civil and political rights. And these are of key concern, especially 
um, as we face issues uh, like elections. So the Law Society has uh, trained lawyers on how to litigate um, around electoral uh, law, uh, looking at um, how the court rules around uh, elections can be improved, as well as looking at the technicalities of how a lawyer can um, successfully uh, litigate when they are faced with a petition uh, around uh, election issues. I would say, um, just in brief, that we, we have done a lot around uh, ensuring uh, institutionalism of the law. Thank you very much. Except for the Bill of Rights, in some, to some extent, the, the level of awareness by the citizen of the Constitution and what it means to them, in my view, is quite low. So we need to do a lot of work. I, some of us were proposing that the Constitution should be taught at, at the lowest level of education and right through the educational process. It's one thing to have a good document. By and large, I'm happy with this document. It's not a perfect document, but I think we can live with it for a long time. But are our people making use of it? Are they making use of the Constitution? Do they understand what it means to them? Do they understand if their rights are violated? Do they understand the remedies available for them? So my answer is we could do more to make our people appreciate the value of this Constitution and understand their rights in terms of this Constitution. Because a citizen has rights and has obligations. They have rights from Zimbabwe and they have duties to Zimbabwe. And I can go to town about, for example, just even little things like just let's get outside this hotel at this time. Just look at the way people are driving, for example, right? There's a highway code, there's um, the Road Traffic Act. People, are, there's a general irresponsibility. This is what I'm, people are just doing whatever they can to get ahead. We are not acting as if we have a sense, we, we, we are not acting like proud Zimbabweans who own the place and who will get into a road, drive and keep to their lane and also not just cut in front of other people. We you know we're doing whatever it is that we can. It's not only, it's not only the public, it's not the combis and the mishikas, it is ourselves even. I mean, or even the litter problem. How come there's so much litter around? I mean, to me, being a citizen means actually understanding that I am Zimbabwe, you know, I, each of us are Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is not Honorable Mangwana's party or an Honorable Chasis party and government. It is us. You know, if uh, we get drowned in litter, it's us and we throw it away and so on. If we just, um, you know, like try and squeeze onto the roads, we'll have accidents, we'll have the jams that we have. For just that's, that's, Those are the duties. We don't even seem to even think, you know, we don't claim, we don't act like we own the place. We think maybe governments must do something. And this is where I want to just beg uh, to differ with, uh, with Professor Maduku. Prof, I don't think that uh, we can blame the Constitution for failing to solve our problems. Personally, I don't think that is the Constitution. It's us, it's the people who should be citizens. The Constitution, um, I didn't bring my copy, I keep up following Honorable Mangwana's. It's here, it's, it's, it's within these four, um, with these two covers. It's inside here, but it's not going to get up and execute itself or implement itself. It won't say, oh, it's there, it must do something. It, it's not going to do that. Unless we, and one example is, how many times have you walked into a government office or even in a city council office, we want you to be served, and the person there treats you like, uh, I don't know, they are not there. But in this constitution, in chapter nine, there is a provision that goes to detail about how everyone who holds public office must behave. It provides that they must work, they must re remember that, you know, that they are meant to serve rather than to rule, and that they must, and that they must understand that it is from we that they derive it. But we let them carry on. That's just an example. So we need to start Remember that we are the citizens and we must act like that. And I want to just one thing more that I also disagree with the notion that we must align the law to the constitution. Personally, 
I think that is the biggest problem that we have in this country. One of the biggest reasons why we do not have a culture of constitutionalism is that we are, we are folding our arms and we are waiting for open court, the laws to be aligned to the constitution close court. But there's nothing like that because section 2 provides that it is the supreme law of the land. And any law, practice, custom that is inconsistent with this constitution is, is, right now, is invalid. It doesn't need to be aligned or whatever. There's nothing like that. And um, uh, uh, what's it, the transitional provision schedule? Schedule 6, paragraph 10, reads, and I quote, existing laws shall be, uh, all exist, existing laws shall remain in force, but shall be construed to be, open court in conformity with the constitution. So if we sit around and wait for laws, to, please let's stop talking about aligning the laws to the constitution because it's giving an excuse to the duty bearers not to implement it well there, saying, oh, it hasn't yet been aligned. But what is not, what is, is invalid, let's implement it. So I, I, really, I speak with passion on this because I think it's a problem. We only need to align in cases where there's need for new laws, like maybe the, in section three, I think 18, where there must be an act to determine the formulas to be shared with devolution funds, for example. There are certain provisions where new acts of parliament need to be created because there was nothing that provided for that. That's only when we need alignment. But this alignment has become an excuse and is keeping us from the culture of constitutionalism. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and constitutionalism are a prison for for lawyers, uh, to, some, to some degree, it's a practical reality. That, that's why maybe you have a prevalence of uh, lawyers uh, in our body politic uh, at, at the moment. But I think that this is a matter that is central to all humans, that it must start even at primary school level to teach children the idea of constitutionalism to teach children the constitution itself so that they are able to and make it a compulsory language, I mean a subject at university. Because unless that happens, when lawyers have a specific provision that they would like struck down or to test in the constitutional court, then they can come up with a device where they look for a possible litigant. And yet it should be the other way around. The, if the public is well educated regarding the constitution, they should be the ones to step up and say, my right is being violated. Watch American uh, interaction between the police and the citizens. If the police drive up and stop somebody and say, the defendant's example, the person is, what is it that I've done? Why should I give you my, my license? And so, because they know the rights. We are not at that point, and I don't think we have really taken significant steps to ensure that we create the foundation for knowledge around constitutionalism, around the constitution itself. But I, want, I also want to make the point that, uh, as you correctly said, we must feel the constitution. The constitution must reflect what society is going through. Um, to such an extent that we all need to be alive to the fact that amendments will always be necessary in order to bring our constitution up to date. For example, um, at the time that the constitution was made, I don't think there was Twitter then. I, I can't remember. I'm just trying to amplify it. But it wasn't popular. But now, when you talk about freedom of, of expression, if you're a minister, I, I, I was once a minister at some point, uh, people take you to task on those forums. And you, you can't pretend that you are not a government official because you're on a public forum. You still must respond in accordance to what uh, Commissioner Majome was saying. So I, I, I think uh, the, that idea that the Constitution uh, is very, very important, but can be looked at uh, to take into account 
what is happening at, at that time, I think is, is very, very important. Subject to the right that the Constitution should not be um, amended willy really, really. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I just want to do two small things. I, I'm not going to respond to Jesse's thing. All right. But I want to do two small things. One is to contribute to the discussion on what is constitutionalism. I, I think that the easiest way of understanding constitutionalism is, is, a, is a way of life. Those who wield power do not have everything. And that you are a player. In other ways, there is a clear demarcation of responsibilities between those that have power and those that are governed. So if you live in a world where you know that those in power have limited power, you know, the idea of limited power, the whole concept of constitutionalism, you know that there's a government, but it can't do everything. I mean, they can't always tell us whatever to do. And that's what is making. So why I want to make that contribution is when we say that the NCA wanted a people-driven, it was part of constitutionalism. We wanted, whether we're going to pretend that people were writing, but that pretense was going to be part of a process of ensuring a way of life. What our, when you listen to this, oh, lawyers say, no, it can't be done. And it can't be. No, they must be found a way in which, even if you are to pretend, that's my understanding of constitutionalism, just to ensure that people are seen to be the ones doing it, but not to be very open and say that we will determine this and so on. Remember that uh, there is a well called an old expression, and unfortunately it's for lawyers, justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. The people must not, they must be seen to be, that's where the NCA was coming from. It knew of course the NCA that they might not be able to debate uh, I mean, some concept about the rule of law. But you must tell them, you explain to them, and so on. I think that uh, if you compare our process and the process in other countries, you have degrees. There are areas where we were better, but there are areas where we didn't do it properly. Especially when Dagina, Conor Bumangwana, but when I came, he was giving you the history of what they did. But when I know Garapa Kona, Munafest, you know that kind of thing. That is how it was said, but it's not terrible. And then they are open about it. And then there's that documentary is referring to like how we about these guys. Even President Gabbana went to Gabbana too. I think I remember somewhere they are saying no. So they really, at the end, it's who would have preferred the situation where I want to put out the doctor. What do you about to know about others? We have to know it is so, but as we try so, I can put Then that way you promote it. Constitution. Please, that's what I want to say. But I appreciate that. That's my first year contribution. Then in Jesus, we say, look, we are not happy with this process. And then instead of course of going go in the streets and so on, they say let's go to to court and try and do it. And what do they meet in court? They meet a constitution that uh, creates a powerful court, a powerful court that can actually give a judgment without giving reasons. Can you imagine? <laughs> to say that uh, you go before seven judges and you have a very critical issue for the country. Then these seven judges are allowed to come and say, look, we dismiss your application and our reasons will follow. And then these reasons may never follow in, the, in our lifetime. Is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> and then we live with that. Now, I, I, was, I was not going to blame the Constitution. I think they should tell you that story. <laughs> I don't know, but I don't So, but if I had heard I think I would have found a way to ask you. I mean, I'm not a supporter. Now, you are my young boy. You are the one There is no court that must give a judgment before giving reasons. Thank you. State your reasons and you give us your judgment. 
you hold it. Now, this is Zimbabwean courts. This idea what you sit there, you give. And sometimes, one of my judgments, you are a good man. You are a man. You are a good man. You are a We are in a rush. If we have had arguments put there, let's give them time. You can come after two days. And then you, but give your reasons first. Now, normally, when you find my court decision that is delayed, uh, what they do, I know judgment, as I as to not reason. Oh, you told a time, I just my team, my reason. I'm not going to reason, I eat it. Judgment, I eat it. Judgment, I eat it. Judgment, I eat it. Randuta, I'm speaking now. This is real. It's actually happening. And we can't allow a situation like that. So I'm not, I'm not saying, when citizens are trying to rescue a situation, the constitution is somewhat where it must provide, if it can't, of course other mechanisms are, are more serious. I'm watching a Because when we are doing our own monster, our own one, why should he go and put people in the streets to make a simple point that he thinks that, uh, let's look at the percentage, the constitution says 20% Violence. I think my apply formula is wrongly. That is what they are trying to say. And that's why they are in courts now. Can we have a look at it? Can the courts, the, the constitutional court actually refuse to deal with that issue? Okay, fine. So I think the culture. Culture, I think now, if I may close. You know, there is a situation where citizens uh, don't live. My lawyers are not going My lawyers are not going and into the party, one and one, two, and this is how we arrogant. This is how we are one of the things I teach law school days. We have to find one of them who puts up with a tech opportunity. So, when asked, I'm going to use it too. I'm going to use it. I'm going to put the two weeks. I don't know where we use it. Move the anger out of the other one. Look, <laughs> 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 So that's what is happening. But I, my point is this: my citizens must be more and more and more. Look by one last illustration. Today there are people that are meeting and I die there. We end say go with them. We say we can apply. We are going to drama police. We are going to do a meeting. We are going to do what somebody good. You can meeting yet find. We are supposed to go on Tuesday, now two to four. Then so we got busy. I ah, know. Can you move your meeting to Thursday, which is today? This was two to four. Yeah, but Chingo in for my police, I would we have moved our meeting to two to four on Thursday. Everything venue, self venue, everything teaching. My police are like, ah, you're in the summer food. My would have constitutionalism, my town would have never moved on. Because Mobile, you're in the summer food. But look, so that I got to know that I was. This so if we had moved our meeting from 2 to 4 and then wanted to do it at 12 to 2, so I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, if you don't push through, much push it through. So I think I'm going to have to go to the house and go to the house and go to the house and go to the house. But in that one, I said, my right, I think it was gone. And I said, in that one, I said, my right to say, to get a meeting here. 
because in Bibi Gare, but imagine the mentality of the police force. And what they were doing, the other thing, which is, I think Jesse would be interested in them. Don't have a good day, I'm a prisoner. I think I tell you, I'm a prisoner, I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner, I'm a prisoner. I'm a prisoner, 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 I'm a prisoner. I think everyone, I don't know, claim you, I'm a prisoner, I'm a prisoner. But I'm a prisoner, I'm a prisoner, I'm a prisoner. So you can imagine that by Tahiti admitting him, constitutionalism requires you sometimes to assert your position. And that's not a wrong thing, because the Bible is about Tara, and that's not a true truth. That's not a true truth. That's not a true truth. And then we, the, 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 we, we, we had thematic committees and we deliberately said, well, this is history and I, I want it corrected. We deliberately said that in every thematic committees, film committee, 30% of the people there shall be MPs and 70% shall be non-MPs, shall be civil society. So it's not, a, it's not historical, so historically correct that the constitution was done by politicians only. That's why you saw your Alex Magaisa and the company, they were not even near the parliament, but they were there. Um, of course, when we were deciding certain things, some people had to make decisions, you know, um, and, 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 and I'm serious. Honorable Mangwana, myself, I think Jesse, we, we, we went to Kenya and we saw how the Kenyan system did not work. We, we looked at the example of Zambia and we saw that Zambia started constitution making eight years before us, but they had not even completed anything and we were overtaking them. That, that's one historic fact that you, you must know. You must also know that uh, the, the co-chairs were members of parliament, including the deputy co-chair, JC was deputy co-chair as well as spokesperson, members of parliament. The drafters of the constitution were um, uh, Brian Crozier, never near a constitution in a, in a, a parliament in his life, uh, Justice Chinengo never campaigned for any position, public position, and uh, Priscilla Mazonga, a, a lawyer in private practice. Those are the people who then put uh, uh, the, those, those, those uh, uh, clauses together. Just as a historic fact. The second historic fact I want to 
challenge everybody here is that we actually have a good constitution. We have a good constitution, but a good constitution does not necessarily mean a good constitutional order. A good constitutional order is a matter of attitude of the rulers. You can have a good constitution as long as there is no political will to observe it, political will to enforce it, you will have a bad constitutional order. Imagine if you give the devil the Bible to administer. Will he dispense justice and holiness? <laughs> so, similarly, if you give people who are by nature dictatorial and you give them a democratic constitution, you won't have democracy. So the answer to our conundrum, the answer to our problem lies elsewhere, lies on what we should do as citizens. You know the American Constitution uh, did not have the equality rights in the American Constitution. Was there when Martin Luther King and the company were doing their struggles, when they were going to the street, the equality clause was there. All men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with the second inalienable rights. You see, uh, but there was no constitutional order and they demanded it. And as, as, as Zimbabweans, as citizens, let's follow the example of Jose Mati, the Cuban hero. He says, rights, rights are not asked for. They are demanded. They are not freely given. They are taken. We must take our rights. We must assert our rights. I'll give you an example how I asserted my rights. I was, uh, I was uh, charged with insulting Mugabe uh, sometime. Uh, when I said the decision to pull out of Zimbabwe, out of the Commonwealth, was an act of foolish bravery. And uh, I was, uh, the, 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 the policeman who, 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 who arrested me said, therefore you mean that the president is foolish. I said, but I didn't say that. Then he says, but did you mean the president was clever? Then I said, I didn't mean that as well. <laughs> He, he, I was arrested. It was very uncomfortable. I went to the cells in, 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 in Mashimbo and uh, I refused to apologize. I, 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 I took my case to the Constitutional Court and many, many years later, uh, I, actually, I actually won it uh, under the freedom of expression. So you want to go to heaven but you don't want to die. This constitution, this constitution provides the minimum rights that you need. Don't wait for the state to protect you. Don't, that's why I'm disagreeing slightly with Dr. Uh, Professor Madhu. No, the constitution as it stands protects us. That, that constitution protects me, gives me the right to appear before the constitutional court. And that constitution says, when a, a citizen is appearing before a constitutional court, you must not go technical. And the judges went technical as if they were in a technical tutorial. Why? Because we allow them to. The accountants have one principle which is very interesting. If a person is, a, is put in a position where they can steal money and not be caught, they will steal it. If so fact, if the rulers are given, are put in a position where they can emasculate your rights without you raising your your your, your head and uh, protesting, they will emasculate your rights. <laughs> we, ladies and gentlemen, let's not fool ourselves. The constitution is there. You have yet the lawyers who who are not the drafters and who are uh, officials, bystanders, objective people, even Professor Madhu, he says, it's a better document. Uh, and it's a... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Begrudging, of course, right? The rights are there. South Africans don't have a better constitution than us. Kenyans don't have a better constitution by us, but they have a better constitutional order. Because what they do in Harare, they can't do it in Johannesburg. 
What they do in Harare, they can't do it in Nairobi because the people there assert their rights. So the take home uh, uh, thing here is that let's assert our rights. They are there. And let's compliment one another when we are fighting to assert our rights. Yes. Thank you. So I wanted to know that, uh, you know, when you are speaking, Honorable uh, Mawana and Honorable Senator Monzola, you seem like you are proud when you make this constitution. I wanted to know that, uh, are you also proud of the constitutional amendment that has been done in the past years, despite that like, people who have said no? I know uh, Professor Maduk said this is an OPF culture to change the constitution. I don't know how uh, Senator Monzola got up in the OPF behavior. Then secondly, uh, uh, secondly, I also want to know that uh, Senator Mondra went to court uh, to postpone some one of your prayers in that President Mugabe, President Mugabe, sorry, should not uh, proclaim election days before uh, uh, to uh, uh, read, read to the delimitation, uh, which you know also led to the violation of Section 158 of the uh, that's also Professor Matuk, who is the lawyer. So I want to know, are you also proud that because that you've tried to formulate that now you pray that it should be violated by the constitutional court in the context of postponing elections in Zimbabwe? Uh, they, uh, Thank you. Those are two questions. Two questions. <laughs> <laughs> so called alignment in 2015, and you are in 2023, which means you've had eight years to do the so called alignment of the Supreme Law of this land. I want to know at what time you're going to finish this so-called alignment because like what other lawyers here say it is nothing like that. So why are you stalling this progress? Is it a matter of the Minister of Justice being incompetent, being not uh, able to do the task? And my other question goes to the co-chair of COPA. After you drafted the constitution, did you also make provision on how this uh, new constitution was going to be so-called aligned to the laws? I ask this question because even if you go to the court of law, you will find that there's always a discrepancy on what the Criminal Codification Act is saying, what the Constitution is saying, what the particular act is saying. Thank you. My second question goes to Comrade Mangwana and Comrade Charles. How did you even get to a stage? I ask this question to you because I know you're all members of parliament and you have two thirds majority in parliament. How did you get to a stage of amending a constitution that you have not fully implemented? Is that what you want to do to the people of Zimbabwe? Lastly, no, my last question, this is pregnant. I should have started with this one. Section 17 of the act, I just think Zimbabwe will not generate our country. We Zimbabwe constitute fifty-four percent of the population of this country. And those who sit in Parliament and Senate went on to amend the constitution and shall a legality of extending the sixty proportional representation seats. Section seventeen of the constitution is clear on the issue to do with the data balance. We were quiet after twenty eighteen when we had illegally constituted parliament, illegally constituted senate. Ensuring that the conscience is violated. Yes. That's, that, that, that's, that's, that's my opinion. Now, my questions are the first one, uh, this goes to the drafters and every other lawyer on the panel, of course. 
the whole the whole point of finance. <laughs> Do you think that the transitional provisions, Madam Chairman, uh, you were referring to, Madam Commissioner, you were referring to? Uh, uh, can you repeat the, your first statement? Statement about the. I, I think about parliament and I believe Parliament and the executive. You have colluded, particularly this parliament that ran from that is running from 2018 to 2023. You have colluded in as far as violating the constitution is concerned. Now my question is, I, I was hearing Madam Commissioner when you said uh, when you talked of transitional provisions. Don't you think when we hear these transitional provisions, we should give a set deadline for certain for certain things that need to be done to conform with the constitution? For example, we have a national peace and reconciliation commission whose lifespan, according to section 252. If I'm correct, should six hundred fifty one sorry, should stretch for ten years. Unfortunately, half of its life was done without any of the end. Don't you think when the when the constitution was drafted, there was supposed to be many a deadline for some of these things? Because honestly, in 2023, the life of the emperors, unless some miracle happens, I was hoping a constitutional amendment, this the, 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 the second amendment, was going to cure that. But unfortunately it didn't happen. So do you think those traditional provisions have provided many take into some of these things? That's number one. Number the number two one goes to, to, to Parliament. Do you think are you happy with uh, how you've executed your and performed your roles in as far as one of the nineteen is concerned, in as far as making sure that all agents of the state and everyone else conform to what is in the constitution? Thank you. Honorable Mangwana, on this notion that uh, people are not asserting their rights because probably they're just not failing to do so. The problem is uh, found in, I think, section 7 of the Constitution. So I just want to read it loud so that we avoid any doubt. It says that the state must promote public awareness of this Constitution, in particular by, in particular by, a tra <coughs> translating it into all officially official recognized languages and disseminating it as widely as possible. B. Requiring this constitution to be taught in schools as part of the curricula for the training of members of the security services, the civil service, members and employees of the public <coughs> institution. Then C. Encouraging all persons and organizations, including civil organizations to disseminate awareness and knowledge of the constitution throughout the society. So it will be unfair to blame the ordinary citizen when the state itself has not done all these things that it has been actually entitled and is obliged to do under the constitution. And the mockery of it is that it actually appears in chapter in section 7 under the founding principle of this constitution. So it's quite actually a lot of that. Yeah, the state is actually done nothing in terms of those three points. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you, very correct. So we will uh, give the panelists the opportunity to, to respond, and then we'll, so we'll take another round of, uh, of questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, that's Chris. That's Chris. Uh, thank you very much, Chris College, for this great opportunity. And uh, thank you also to the panelists for your contributions. Uh, firstly, um, I want to commend Chris and the Commission for this good opportunity. Uh, my question goes to Senator Munzora. You have spoken passionately about the Constitution and I respect you for, for your contribution to the Constitution of uh, Jim Copper. So, my question is uh, I see you have uh, approached the Constitutional Court and you want the, the harmonious elections to be, to be post postponed. Doesn't that create a Constitutional crisis? And is there any legal basis that to allow the the, the post, post, postponement of the election post uh, post uh, 26 August? So that's my question. Thank you. So so last uh, the panelists to is, is another question. Uh, let's have the response and then we'll come to other questions, right? So we'll just starting with what? Oh yes. Thank you. I will respond to the question about the transitional provisions and timelines. I absolutely agree with you. I think one of the things that um, we could have done better, in my view, was to follow the Kenyan example, for example. They 
introduced a constitutional, they, they created a constitution implementation commission. Um, and today, and it's, it's always busy, it's got power, and it's got authority to make sure that constitutional obligations are followed. But what, what I think the best that we did was to uh, enact section 324, which as you know provides that. I suppose it's a very short provision. All constitutional obligations must be performed diligently and without delay. But uh, I suppose without the political will that uh, Senator Gonzalo was speaking about, um, it's, it's left to the discretion of those who, who have power. And um, it's, it's, it's really uh, unfortunate. That's why, this is why I keep saying that, you know, personally, I don't think that, this is why I keep saying we don't have citizens, we have people of Zimbabwe. I really don't think, in fact, I think it's futile to expect that the power bearers are going to, you know, they are not in a hurry, they really, things are working out for them. I really don't think keeping on saying, yes, you must do that, you must reform this, you must align. I mean, I think we are spending all our time watching, looking at the alignment ball only, and we're not doing the other things that we can as citizens um, assert. And I'll just say that I remember when we were in the Parliamentary Legal Committee with, um, with, with the Honourable Chassis, uh, when the first constitutional amendment was going to be passed, I mean, fixing something that is not broken, I remember the battles that we had, because the Parliamentary Legal Committee, as you know, is the way bridge that checks to see if all, any bill that's going through Parliament meets, is, is consistent with the Constitution. We ended up, uh, I think Honourable Gone said, I ended up having to go to court, because even some of the meetings, Honourable Chasli and the other members held a meeting that uh, we were not at, because we were still conducting consultations. I'm just saying this to show how the stakes are, are so high, and that seriously, if we are going to keep thinking that, oh, but they must do it, they must fix it, and, you know, uh, waiting for them to align the law, yet the Constitution already gives us rights, it creates, it, it already created a reality today, it is, and, um, you know, I thought I'd just say that, that uh, we don't have a time frame, but the time frame is us, if we become citizens, we observe our obligations, but we also demand and take and take our, our rights. Because that way, even surrendering, because it's not working to surrender our constitutional hopes to the, to the courts. The constitutional court, for me, is the most anti-constitutional court ever. I fear that at the rate that it's going, it's actually going to find itself without any work. It might need to be retrenched. It is key on knocking out, giving technical knockouts to most arguments. It doesn't, it's not, it doesn't have appetite at all to, 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 to give, to decide on the Constitution. So if we're going to keep on pinning our hopes on somewhere up there in the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, and not become citizens and assert ourselves and have the confidence, God help us. We have provisions allowing and setting out how it, it can be amended. It means that we are alive to the fact that at some stage of this life, it may require amendment. There is no perfect law, there is no perfect constitution. But we clearly a way which provisions can easily be amended and which provisions should not be amended that easily. If you read that question, you find out that uh, the Bill of Rights can only be amended after a referendum. First of all, it is to pass through Parliament, you get today's majority, after today's majority, uh, then uh, a referendum has to be held. Then you have other provisions which can, only, which can be amended uh, through a voting parliament for a two-thirds majority. That in itself is an admission that some stage of this life a constitution can be amended. And a political party, and I always say this, if you do not want an appeal to amend the constitution, make sure that it does not have a two-thirds majority. If it is a two-thirds majority, it is it is a natural right to use that power. But but it is a political duty to restrain this power. Now it has taken ten years with Zambia having a two-thirds majority, and it is only done to amend it. 
Only. In ten years. So, so that is the answer. It can be amended. Uh, I may have my own personal views about uh, certain amendments, but politically, my party has amended what it felt should be amended, and the, pol the constitution allows it to do so. Thank you. Uh, I know there was no direct question. But for us, the concern is that uh, the amendments have been upsetting the balance of power that has been laid out in the 2013 Constitution. We have seen that the amendments have been to overshadow the role of Parliament and also the role of the judiciary by the executive. So the amendments have been to increase the power of the executive, mainly the president, to centralize the power in the president appointing the Chief Justice, the Deputy Chief Justice, the Judge President, if we know the implications on independence of the judiciary. There are so many other provisions that have been amended that we wish not to have been amended. For us to have the concept of separation of powers still being entrenched in the Constitution. So as human rights lawyers, we are not able to the amendments, but as you said, they are political amendments because of the two-thirds majority. And then I also wanted just to support what my brother Amadou Chivasa said about Section 7 of the Constitution, when the government is supposed to be encouraging everyone, including civil society, to take out the Constitution to the communities. But what we see, especially from November 2021, is in a consorted effort by government to disable civil society. They've introduced amendments to regulation of civil society organizations, where it's going to be literally difficult for organizations to operate. And on the ground at the moment, it's not very easy for civil society organizations to access communities and increase awareness on the Constitution. So I just wanted to say that uh, whilst we see that there's an alignment of laws with the Constitution, some of the laws that have been introduced to actually amend the Constitution. They are not in compliance with the constitutional provisions. And what is particularly disappointing is that at times, there's been technical advice that has been provided by independent people, including the United Nations Special Rapporteurs on some of these amendments. But these amendments are, and the proposals by the United Nations have been ignored, especially on issues to do with um, enabling environment for civil society organizations, particularly when it comes to the Private Voluntary Organizations Amendment Act. Thank you. There was also no question directly um, pointed at you, but um, just to give a comment, I think uh, in terms of uh, the reforming institutions and the other issues that have been uh, pointed out around constitutional awareness uh, and uh, what we was speaking about uh, around women's political participation, my brief comment would be uh, Maybe for the realization of constitutionalism and rule of law, government must also um, display its political will in terms of resourcing those institutions so that the, the resources become the fuel for the institutions to then achieve what they are mandated to. I think it is fair to say that uh, most of the questions were directed at me. <laughs> and, um, my very, two very brilliant, three very brilliant young, young men. Um, and I want to do justice to their very just question. The first question is whether I am proud. Yes, I am proud. I am proud that in 1995, at the age of 25, I took the government to court in the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the Electoral Act. And I actually said elections must not happen because the Electoral Act is unconstitutional. I lost, but I am proud that I made that effort. I am proud that in 1997, I took the political parties finance act to court in the constitutional court and this time I, I, I got my act together. I was 27 and older and wiser and uh, I, was, I, was, I, I succeeded and uh, changed the jurisprudence to that extent of this country. I'm proud of that. I'm proud that I was a member of 
two distinct constitutional movements. Uh, the one under for Desi, uh, to start with advocating for the drafting of the new constitution and uh, being asked to be one of the drafters at my age at that time. I'm proud of that. I'm proud that I associated myself with the Professor Mumbe, Professor Madugu, John Makumbe, Masipula Sitole, um, and, and, and those people who fought against the Constitution Commission draft in 2000. I'm proud of that. I'm proud that uh, I was part uh, and parcel of the drafting of the NNCA Constitution. I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud that I was a member of COPAC and tried to defend as much as I could the views of the people of Zimbabwe. I'm very proud of that. I am very proud that I have been consistent in defending, in the defense of two demographic groups in this country. Now, the second question is that, are you proud of amendment number two? No, I am not proud of amendment number two. I didn't bring it, I didn't draft it, I didn't introduce it to parliament. And amendment number two is not my document. When you hear people say it's Monzora's document, that's propaganda. I am a member of the opposition and I don't introduce bills uh, under the current system. Now, there are a few things that about amendment number two that are not known or not spoken about. Amendment number two came as one complete amendment. And it contained four issues, uh, I think six issues, I think. Uh, one was the removal of the running mate. The second one was the extension of the age of the judge, uh, especially the judge of the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court. The third one was introduction of the youth quota in parliament. The fourth one was the introduction of the women's quota in local government. And the fifth one was the maintenance of the sickest uh, seat quota for women in parliament. Now, when, you, when we went to committee stage, committee stage is where you are, you are arguing one point uh, at a time and you're not voting for the entire uh, amendment. So at committee stage, and I want you to go and read the answer, there is no MP, there is no senator who spoke better than I against the extension of the judges. You can go to the you can go to to, 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 to Hansard and see for yourself and read for yourself. This is objective objectively verifiable. And now the, the, there were three things that I supported. I supported the youth court. I believe that the youths are not leaders of tomorrow. They are leaders of today, and they must be in parliament. I support that, and I'm proud of that. I supported that women must have a quota in, 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 the, in the local government, and I think that's a correct thing to do. I supported it, and I can defend it. I then supported that the women's quota that was there should not be phased out because the conditions that we thought would exist at this point in time do not exist. Our political system is against women participation by its very adversarial nature. That was why, that was why I, I, I then said, I support the youth quota, I support the women's quota, I support the women's quota in local government. I don't support removal of the running mate. I don't support the extension of, of, the, of the age of the judge. And I tried, maybe you don't know this, I went direct to the Minister of Justice, and you can go and ask him. I went to him and said, this is disaster. And I tried to persuade him. I even tried to phone President Monangama. So, the, 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 what then happens, ladies and gentlemen, what then happens is, after you have debated the amendments, you are then asked to vote for the amendment as one, either yes or no. The consequences of my yes, my no, was going to be, I'm saying no to the youth court. And I don't know how I was going to face the youth in my part if I said no to the youth court. 
uh, I, I was going to say no to the women's quarter in local government and in parliament. Now, please go and read, and the hazard is there, and the deaths are there. What you have been told is propaganda, so that you see me differently from what I really am. I'm a good guy. <laughs> Uh, relates to my application in the Constitutional Court. And uh, my brother, my two brothers, young brothers, who may be sons now, um, are saying that uh, I made an application to the Constitutional Court for postponement of elections. Where did you get that? Where did you read that? Except that, no, let me finish. Except that you read it in the news day except that you read it on Twitter, when people who are my critics were mischaracterizing my application. I invite you to read the application. And the application says, the delimitation is in, the report is invalid for four reasons, uh, principally. Number one, uh, it does not refer to population uh, of Zimbabwe. In other words, I do not know uh, the number of people who are 17 last year and who are 18 now. The delimitation report doesn't inform me. I do not know the number of people who are 13 years old who will be 18 years in 2028. I am interested in that. I am interested in that statistic. This uh, delimitation report is not informing me and therefore it is invalid. Number two, it says that there must be 20% variance only among the constituencies. I was able to demonstrate that in 119 out of 210 constituencies, uh, that rule was violated. Number three, I was able to demonstrate that when President Munangagwa made his pro uh, proclamation of the delimitation, he omitted certain fundamental issues. Number one in the gazette, the, the, the gazette refers, uh, sorry, the, 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 the gazette refers to annexure A, annexure B, annexure C of the delimitation report, and they were not attached, they were not there. And the, 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 the law says when the president proclaims, uh, he must proclaim the names and the boundaries of, uh, of constituencies. President Munangagwa didn't do that. And, uh, I, I also I thought, number four, that the naming of the polling stations, giving them courts, is a recipe for disaster. It's a way of election manipulation. Now, uh, my, my primary school, where I vote, is called Madziwa Primary School. But under the delimitation report, it is called the polling station 005 CTC 210. So I must tell the, the parents in the in the in Yana that when you, when time of voting comes, <laughs> go to polling station 005 CTC <laughs> Now my prayer was misunderstood. My prayer is number one, a declaration of invalidity. Declare this bad delimitation invalid. Even professors are saying it is invalid. You are, he actually said it is outrageous. <laughs> then number two, that Z must be ordered to redo. Then number three, that President Nangagwa must proclaim deaths after receiving that uh, 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 redone report. I never argued for a postponement. And you know why I didn't do that? I did not know how long it would take Z to correct itself. I had no means of knowing that. But there are people who have who advocated for a postponement, and there were two parties who did that, not MDC. One party was the ZANU PF. In its argument that we must return to the 2008 boundaries. Now, if we if we did that, it means the president was supposed to reproclaim and give six months notice. That means the election was going to be postponed by six months. It's not me, it's them. And then uh, um, the, 
the amicus, the friend of the court who came, uh, Jeremiah Bam. Uh, I have told you, he was coming from the uh, uh, what, what, what <laughs> and, and Jeremiah uh, uh, says the election must be postponed by one month. It's not me, I'm not a Jeremiah, it's him. <laughs> 158. You didn't refer to section 67. If there is a, a, a collusion, a, a collision between two provisions, one provision in Bill of Rights and the other provision in outside the Bill of Rights, you know which prevails, don't you? It is the provision in the Bill of Rights. And it, the provision in the Bill of Rights gives us a right to free and fair elections. Elections under this delimitation uh, uh, report are not free, are not fair. So, Section 67 protected my right. Section 158 gives you a timetable for elections. It is outside the Bill of Rights. If those two clash, the one which takes precedence is Section 67. But I want to assure you, I don't want to prolong the suffering of the people of Zimbabwe <laughs> uh, by performing the election. <laughs> I know that going to elections under this delimitation report will prolong the suffering of the people of Zimbabwe. <laughs> delimitation report is totally irresponsible. You know why? You know Zidera, Zidera links sanctions to free and fair elections. So for two delimitations, for, for two elections, we know the sanctions will remain. We know that the sanctions will remain. And we are being, we are applying to join the common world. And the common world they say, yes, be free and fair elections. It means that if we go now, we won't have uh, 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 admission in the common world. And you know the benefits of being admitted in the common world? I know it because I benefited from the common world. We are given scholarships. Uh, your, your, your footballers go and play common world games. Your runners go there. You get a grants, a development grants from the common world. You have free travel in the common world. Why should I not want that for my people? So this going to election under this delimitation report is a recipe of disaster for disaster. And I was right to fight it. And I need your support, my young brother. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm sure this might be the last time that I have the mic. Uh, I want to acknowledge the great work that the luminaries of our constitution making process were privileged to have today. Um, you know, the role that they have played. One hopes that some of the nuggets that we have received today will be recorded somewhere. Uh, is the more preparing of the Constitution, explaining precisely uh, what happened uh, in the Constitution making process for, for posterity. The second point I would like to make concerns uh, rather amplifies what has been said already about the importance of citizens to understand the Constitution especially the Bill of Rights. Because looked at in a strict sense, those rights, generally speaking, are claims against the state. That's why when we talk most of the time, we are talking about the citizen and the government. And so it's very, very important that the citizen is aware and is able to claim those rights. I want to link this to what Linda uh, who has just uh, walked out saying, saying women and their right to participate uh, in, in parliaments. Uh, I, I think that's an area that is crying out for a lot of uh, improvement. Go to any church, the majority of people there will be women. Go to any political gathering, Needs to see a gathering where the majority are, are men unless they be a <laughs> So it makes a lot of sense. The 50 50 uh, arrangement. 
And in my own personal view, I think it must become obligatory for political parties to make sure they produce that proportion when they go for elections. I also think that there are many factors that impact on the capacity of women to, to participate in politics. I come from a constituency where there are so many compounds, commonly known as Makombo, where they find a little of 14 year old girls. They fail to go to school, and unless those very fundamental uh, steps are taken to ensure that the girl child actually goes, goes to school, this issue about 50 people will continue to be academic. But I also think that the law is a, a role to play. I know that in Namibia they have taken legislative steps to ensure that that ratio is uh, achieved. And unless we take practical steps at party level, we are going to have a political system that is women are preeminent. We can say as much as we want, but unless we take those steps to educate the girl child, the steps to ensure that political parties are destroying their patriarchal system, there is no way that is going to be achieved. I want to thank you very much. Sorry, what was the question? It was about the adherence to the constitution by parliament. It was. Oh, oh yes, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure what uh, when the question was asked. Uh, I had a conceptual problem trying to understand uh, how. We he is he's still here, he can repeat. <laughs> if it is repeating, then he's saying what he said before. Yes. But I, I, what I'm saying is, yes. they, 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 yes. I, I don't believe that Hannah was yes. yes. It is possible that Hannah can collude with the executive. I think maybe what he wanted to say was to blame members of Parliament from say Zambia for colluding with the Party that is governing, which is unpainful. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure you know, how else uh, the system will operate, but I think uh, uh, Honorable Mawana did address the, the, the issue. Uh, it's, it's best if the, the party has got the majority. Um, what? We just have to know that we have two ways to consent that litigation, but we also have to say certain things. Enough is enough, can off of that. If something is wrong, in it is wrong. Let's say government is going for the next year, I think, uh, and so on. Carabao in that election. That's what they say. The underwater in the constitution. And then, we are going to be young and go to any date. We are going to run. Let's say we decide the issues with you. You just don't know wrong. There are many men who go through. We should not have things like that in a country. Parents are not allowed to die, but they are not allowed to die. election, I am not allowed to die. 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 I am don't come to say, well, I'm not a man of a demons or a little who puts us tough place. <laughs> no one wants to postpone an election. The election must be free and, and fair, and the environment must be okay for the election to take place. And I think the debate must be like that, and so on. Do being passed and being aligned with the Constitution because there are several parties to be involved. It's the Ministry of Justice, who is the coordinator of the alignment process. And granted, yes, the Minister of Justice is also the leader of government business, who coordinates business and parliament. But for bills to go through parliament, the current ministries of those specific bills are involved. The public is so surviving. We should be involved. Uh, our whole lawyer panel. panel. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it was great really to have you communicating with us, uh, the people from the Ministry of Justice, uh, those from Parliament, particularly those from the Relief Zambia Party, who are here attending some of our functions. The Law Society, the NCA, the NVCT, is the NHRA. Uh, thanks so much, Comrade Ross, for coming through. Uh, we also extend sincere thanks to Zimbabweans, especially the members of Christ in Zimbabwe Coalition and our board members who mobilized and actively participated in the meeting. Uh, we also like to thank our partners, uh, the Zimbabwe Constitutional Movement, Zikoma Project, the USA, Veritas, and NIO. We also want to thank our alliance partners, uh, Partnerships for Justice, the Legal Resources Foundation, and the activities to celebrate, promote, and defend our constitution. We will inform you of other upcoming activities in all provinces. We we'll also continue with these high-level policy dialogues in Harare, focusing on the constitution and its relationship to the economy, elections, human dignity, and progress in general. But obviously, the most important person to thank right now, you'll be sure that we want to thank uh, the Chief Superintendent Moyo, who supported us and allowed us to be meeting here. In a normal democracy, I wouldn't be thanking you, but we have to thank him now because he allowed us to meet here. I think he's among us today. Uh, but at the end of the day, I just want to close by maybe reminding those who have power that there is one incentive that can force you to respect the Constitution. Imagine those who are close to you, especially those who have guns. Choose not to respect the constitution the same way that you do on your daily basis because of your power. Imagine how your power crumbles. So at the end of the day, that should be the biggest incentive to respect the constitution. And I think we should have learned our lessons from the coup that we experienced as a country. And we expect those in power to respect the constitution more than our citizens. Because the day the citizens withdraw from the constitution and the system